One of the most common themes among ghost stories is that the hauntings are usually tied to some traumatic experience. Unable to escape this experience, the spirit stays behind, trapped in this moment. Some might frame it as emotional energy, left behind, which affects anyone who stumbles into it. Others still might suggest that it's not really humans at all, but mysterious and evil things our bad experiences draw in, like moths to a light in the darkness. Since it's October, and we're approaching Halloween, I want to tell another ghost story, this one also from my home state of Kansas. But before we get there, allow me to set the stage. Kansas is named after the Kansas River, which is in turn named after the Kansa people, more widely known today as the Kaw. It was first explored by the Western powers in the mid-1500s by Spanish conquistador Francisco Coronado as he set out in search of treasure. They observed that the region was home to many tribes of Native Americans, including the Wichita and the Pawnee. It would be nearly a hundred years later that the French would establish trade relationships with some of these Plains Indians as they traveled the rivers, and in 1804 the region was explored by Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Only a short time later, in 1830, the U.S. government would pass the Indian Removal Act and would forcibly relocate tribes from the north to the Kansas area. Around this same time, the Santa Fe Trail cut through Kansas and became a major trade and immigration route through the Midwest to the West. Some seeds of the eventual American Civil War were also planted about this time, with Thomas Jefferson ending the overseas slave trade in 1807, and then the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which admitted neighboring Missouri to the Union as a slave state, and Maine as a free state. The Missouri Compromise was then undone in 1854 by the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which established that the status of slavery in each territory would be determined by the residents. This, along with an ongoing expansion westwards, opened the floodgates for new settlers seeking to determine the fate of these new territories. Kansas became known as Bleeding Kansas. Naturally, as more and more settlers came to the area, there was ever-increasing tension with the Native Americans as well. And at this point, many of the natives in the area were no longer in their historical lands to boot. Skirmishes between the natives and the ever-encroaching tradesmen and settlers in the Kansas Territory increased greatly. Many of the engagements were small raids along trails like the Santa Fe, but some battles involved hundreds of men. Eventually, though, those seeds of the American Civil War would sprout, and it was after the Civil War, with the new nation less institutionally divided, that its gaze on the Native American populations became much more focused. Clashes between American settlers and Native Americans became more and more common, more reported, and of more concern. Treaties would be made and disregarded, and famous or infamous generals like Custer and Sheridan would become household names. The Native Americans were methodically driven from their homelands. The end of the Civil War also saw the beginnings of the massive cattle drives from Texas and Mexico to reach railroads that could transport beef to the more populated East Coast. One famous route that cut through central Kansas was the Chisholm Trail. Racial and cultural tensions were as high as they could possibly be and resulting in actual wars and indiscriminate violence. A good depiction of this is the American bison a staple of Native American life, whose numbers were estimated to be around 15 million in the wild about the time of the Civil War in the 1860s. But it would plummet to the low thousands in merely 30 years, as their leather was consumed for commercial products, and the military viewed the slaughter as a way to drive the natives out of the ever-expanding American territory. The latter part of the 1800s would only speed things up. The railroads began arriving, bringing with them settlers and Spanish-speaking laborers. Legendary figures of the Wild West, like Wyatt Earp, were busy developing their reputations in the cities of Wichita and Dodge City in the 1870s. In 1878, a Cheyenne chief called Dole Knife 
tried unsuccessfully to lead his people back to their ancestral land by fighting through Kansas. And the infamous Dalton Gang was robbing banks in Coffeyville in 1892. My point in mentioning all of this history is that Kansas was a significant hotspot in an incredibly hot time. And that sets up the atmosphere for the haunting known as Theorosa's Bridge. In south-central Kansas lies the town of Valley Center, which was first established in 1885 and is not far from the historic Chisholm Trail, the Arkansas River, and the city of Wichita. A few miles north is Jester Creek, and that is where this story takes place. No one knows the precise date or origin of this story. But one day, a family of settlers was in their wagon, and they came up to Jester Creek. A woman in the wagon named Theorosa was caring for her infant when a band of Native Americans attacked. In the midst of the struggle, the baby was stolen from Theorosa, and the captors set off near the creek. Theorosa ran after them, desperate to recover her child. But she was killed in the fighting. And to this day, still wanders the creek near the crossing that is now referred to as Theorosa's Bridge, forever in search of her missing child. The legend also says that if one goes to the bridge to this day and taunts the ghost by claiming to have the baby, she will appear to angrily charge at the individual, only to disappear before arriving. In 1974, and again in 1976, Theorosa's bridge would catch fire and ultimately be destroyed. The current cement bridge was opened in 1991, and you can go there today. Naturally, the sides of this bridge of urban legend are covered in graffiti, which one way or another mark its prominence as it stands in what is still rural Kansas. There are, of course, many variations of this story, which you can follow up on by clicking the link in the episode description. Some are as simple as Theorosa being the name of the missing child and not of the mother, and some are sort of a role reversal that have Theorosa being a Native American woman. Others tell of an angry husband who drowns his wife's child of an affair, or have the mother throwing the baby and herself off the bridge, or have the mother drowning the baby only to feel intense regret and then drown herself as well. There is even an interesting idea that the Theorosa story originated with the Mexican-Spanish-speaking railroad workers who came to the area from Mexico, and that it's really just a version of a story called La Llorona, or The Weeping Woman. The story and its variants are definitely similar in some ways, so let's take a look. A woman named Maria one day saw her husband having an affair. Overwhelmed by rage, she grabbed up her two small children and drowned them that very night. But as the rage subsided, she was overtaken by grief and drowned herself alongside them. Because of her crimes, her spirit is trapped in this world, and she appears at night, weeping for her lost children. But if... The Theorosa is La Llorona take is true, then how did it get associated with a small, rather unimpressive creek crossing in rural Kansas? The original certainly lends itself more to the era of high tension between the natives and the settlers that would have been present in Kansas in the 1800s. A Plains original, or a knockoff of older Latin stories. Either way, does the spirit or emotion of a distraught mother haunt the bridge over Jester Creek outside of Valley Center, Kansas? Do you believe in ghosts? For show notes and more on this topic, check out the link to loreandlegends.net in the episode description. And if you liked this episode, consider tipping at buymeacoffee.com slash loreandlegends, where you can also spend three bucks and get access to the Lore and Legends Vault private YouTube channel we will all have videos of shows that aren't available on the main YouTube channel, as well as some future bonus content. But that's all for this episode. See you next time.